And you're returning to work on one of your signature characters, Dead Man, after a long true. time. That is true. Tell me about how you pitched the character and its new story to DC. Okay, I didn't. Uh, you didn't? No, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I was asked what I wanted to do next. And I had done I had done Batman Odyssey, and I did, did the coming of the Superman, and that was a lot of fun. So what did I want to do next? Because uh, they pay me too much money, <laughs> and if they pay you a lot of money, you got to do a lead character. So I said, well, I could do another Superman, or I could do Dead Man. And they said uh, it was Dan DeDeo who was talking to me. You probably know Dan, and he said, well, we, you really should do Superman because you know we pay you so much money. <laughs> And I said, well, it's okay, but there's things about Dead Man that most people don't know because I didn't tell anybody. You didn't tell anybody? No. When I left Dead Man, I shut up because Dead, there was this long story I was gonna tell and then the book got canceled and I never got to tell the story and I never told anybody that he has a history that nobody knows. He has an older brother and sister, nobody knows. He has a mother and father who have their own circus and there's friction between uh, Boston Brand and his parents. And in fact, the friction is because of the older brother. And the older brother has a problem because his mother, their mother, was gonna die. And the father saved her life by going to Ra's al Ghul and having him save her life. And Ra's al Ghul exerted a toll. The oldest son had to become part of the League of Assassins. Nobody knows any of this. Nobody knows. You didn't tell anybody I didn't tell years. anybody. I didn't tell anybody. So Dan's eyes get bigger and bigger. And, oh, really? Okay. So should I do that one? He says, Yeah, yeah, we'll do that one. We'll do that one. So pretty much, I didn't have to sell it very much, because it's basically a story that you sort of know a part of, mm -hmm. but you only know that part and you don't know the rest. And rest, the rest of the stories that have been done, and this is not meant as a criticism. But when you pass a character on to somebody else, they then do like the continuing adventures of this guy in spandex who happens to be dead, you know, sort of like Casper the dead baby. So you've got six issues planned? Yes. Who's going to be popping up in there? Obviously, oh, Roz. But are you going to bring in all the we, uh, we have all these dark We have all these dark characters that we haven't done. And Dan said, can you put the other dark characters in? Because they were planning them for like a movie and that, that yeah, never just got made. Dark, right. Yeah, that could, which could be very Dr. Fate and uh, all those characters. And Entrigan, Entrigan's great character. He's like a demon. Yeah. And he was based on a, a character in Prince Valiant. Oh. You didn't know that. Didn't Nobody know. does. Well, actually a couple of people, geeks, geeks know. Really deep geeks, okay, they know that. Because in Prince Valiant, Prince Valiant was trying to rescue, I don't know who he was trying to rescue, and of course it was back in the medieval times. And so what he did was he took a duck and skinned the duck and turned it inside out and pulled it over his head. <laughs> and he did it, he looked, like, he looked like a demon. <laughs> so this duck with the, with the feet sticking up and he just had it over his head and he swung through this, you know, mead filled uh, feast hall and scared the hell out of everybody. And very, a very small number of people remember that. Among those, Jack Kirby who created Entrigan. So he basically did that mask as an inverted duck, which looks like a demon. So is it nice to be able to bring this big story? Well, I, to, to, to be, to, to to be, be perfectly to, honest, I'm pissed, that, I'm pissed that it's taken so long for, for it to come around. I've been sitting around plotting this for a long time because I felt Dead Man was on a, on a roll when I first did him. And if it wasn't for the historic time that Dead Man was in, and I was telling you about it earlier, where the direct sales market was beginning to take over, you know, those comic book stores were beginning to take over the regular market. And uh, people are, you know, you, people in America, and it's, it's a really sad thing, is if you're gonna buy comic books, you gotta go into a comic book store. You used to be able to go to yeah. the newsstand. So they're not as available. Direct. Yeah, uh, everybody did it. I mean, they sold millions of copies of a comic book back in the day but now it's gotten into comic book shops and I'm, I'm hoping that the comic book stores will blast out from, from that by doing uh, stories like this and doing su better Superman stories and Batman stories and maybe getting into the, into the, into the theaters and into, the, into your television set and into your computer games. That this kind of story, this kind of long uh, range story will get us out into the marketplace a little bit more because people, people talk about 
they don't read comic books enough and they don't read comic books because they're not a you know there's there's towns that don't have comic book stores but dead man is in that area because we had there was going to be a movie I and mean, they talked about the dead man movie and all the other characters mm -hmm. I'm kind of hoping that what will happen with this, they'll either do a TV show or they'll do a series of movies with Dead Man and these other characters because they certainly deserve to be out there and they deserve to be in the hands of people to also read his comic books. Do so, you think a serialized TV show would do the character more justice in like two I think a movie. movie. I think a movie. I think a movie. Um, like I uh, recreated Arrow, uh, Green Arrow into the character that he is on television. and Yeah, there's an awful, the, there uh, are no shortage of similarities between New York, Green Arrow, right, and right, Arrow on television. Right, they, they, they even borrow characters from our run on uh, Batman, what, Ra's al Ghul and those other characters. They just like- Tali al Ghul, who yeah, we earlier. Let, let's bring her in, let's bring her in, she's gorgeous. So there's a, a, an awful lot of my stuff does get on the air in one form or another. So my feeling is that uh, since we're the cooking pot of the new stuff, then uh, by doing a good dead man, then we're going to enable the, either the film or the television people. We really can't make a choice. I mean, it's not up to me. Mm. I remember they, uh, about uh, 15 years ago, DC Comics called me and said, they're going to make a dead man television show in Canada. And I said, well, okay, so why are you calling me? Because it's going to happen or not happen. They said, well, we thought we'd just call you and just let you know and thought you'd be interested and that you'd like to hear about it. I said, well, they're probably going to change it a little bit. They said, yeah, well, we're going to change it a little bit. Uh, I said, well, exactly what are you going to do to Dead Man? They said, well, first, it's a woman. <laughs> I said, yeah, and she's not dead. <laughs> I'm sorry, not what? Dead woman? We're going to call it Live Woman and not Dead Man? I, mean, I don't quite you're understand. You're, you're no, I'm not. I'm on, no, joke. it was a telephone. It was like, I'm on the phone. <laughs> really? What do you say to somebody who says that to you? Again, like, okay, it's, if whatever you say. Sounds weird, so goodbye. <laughs> that, that doesn't happen quite so much these days, but it truly happened. So I, uh, we, we have more, uh, what's his name, Del Toro, the director? Sure, Guillermo Del Toro. Yeah, he's a big fan of Dead Man, very big fan. He was of attached Dead to the Justice he League was a, Yes, he was attached to it, and Dead Man was gonna be a big part of it. I'm kind of hoping that he'll, this will rekindle his interest. He's a fan of comic book artist's work, so he's a fan of my stuff. I don't. I don't say that uh, uh, to speak for him, but I, you know, the man is a great, is a terrific director, and he'll give you a hug anytime you uh, say hello. And, and he loves uh, the macabre. And, and, and he loves, and he loves. So you have a real good opportunity to see Dead Man as a film. I'm uh, not necessarily uh, saying that my predictions come true, but they do tend to come true. But I would be willing to bet. Are you listening, Guillermo? That Are you I'm listening? Saying within the next couple of years, if I do a good job, we're going to see Guillermo do a. a Movie, a movie, I think, would be better. Your main career in comics lasted a little bit over a decade. Lasted? Is there an ED at the well, end of no, that? No, you're, you're Excuse me. I'm, by the choice, you come in and out. Uh, don't say that you? to the fans at the convention <laughs> because they're like expecting me to be well, still you, doing comic well, books. One, you turned out a ton of, of work, but it was really over like a 10, 12 year period. The truth of the matter is that I came from advertising and illustration when I came into comic books. From my point of view, they were behind the times. They were crippled, a crippled industry. They were, it was, uh, most of them were uh, Neanderthals. They had very bad rules. They, they, they didn't return the original art. They didn't have royalties. They didn't do all the things that a real business does. And so I made it my business to make sure that that changed. So I transitioned to advertising and then I allowed the industry to catch up to me. Now they've caught me. So it's a perfect time for me to come back in. The technology is there. The, the dynamic realism that you brought to comics, how much of that was influenced by your work in advertising? And if you wouldn't have gone into advertising and got, jumped right into comics, do you think you would have had the same, developed the same art style that you did? Art style, uh, so that you know, because it's gonna turn into a uh, learning situation here and I'm gonna be teaching, okay? And I, I apologize for that. A style is what you do wrong. That's what people do wrong. That's why you call it a style. If it were right, it would look like a photograph or like a Norman Rockwell painting. So the more you do it right, the less style you have. The more, the more you do it wrong, the more style you have. So style means you're doing it wrong. I know it's a little, no, it's no, a little self-critical, but it's- I the, can't draw but, a stick, so well, I, okay. I'm certainly and gonna I, listen to what you say about art. Batman, we mentioned earlier, you know, how closely identified you are with him. When you came on board with him and, and, and you and, and Denny O'Neill uh, worked to bring the character out of the, the camp era and all that, 
Um, was there editorial pushback? I'm, I'm always, cause I've heard a lot of, of discussions and read a lot of interviews where you've talked about it, but I, I wondered, was that an edict from Julia Schwartz and no. the bad team or were they kind of nervous about what you were planning to do? You have to remember that, uh, well, they're always nervous at what I'm gonna do. They're always thinking I'm gonna, the castle's gonna fall down. Um, that, there was the TV show. We all love the TV show. There, we, we love the reruns. How can you not love it? I mean, it's wonderful. Uh, and remains wonderful. A star has recently died, and, and uh, we, we, we love him so much that everybody's heart broke because we're so used to him being in our lives, and we're so used to the TV show being in our lives. But that TV show was a satire. It was never meant to be real. It was meant to be a comedy, and it was a comedy, and it was a terrific satire. Pow, you know, all that stuff. Um, but when the show was over, then the question is, what do you do with the comic books? I mean, Batman walking down the street in the daytime, and no kid is pointing at him and saying, Mommy, that's man's in his underwear. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's what would happen. Uh, Batman walking through a door into a meeting room, it just seems so, rather than coming through the window or coming out of a closet or whatever. Um, I know, there's a <laughs> reference there that you, that you were gonna laugh I'm at, and you can't that do it, you can leave it alone. Leave anyway. it alone. So, the, the question was, what do you do? Well, I, of course, uh, because I come from advertising and illustration, I could easily see what the solution was. The solution was make him realistic and do Batman the way he was originally created. I didn't do anything to Batman. I drew him better, but I basically went back to the Jerry Robinson, uh, Bob Kane Batman and brought him forward in time and just left out that middle area of satire that was no longer there. We had humor but not satire. We didn't make fun of him. We made him a realistic character. So by doing that, I mean, they were actually, the uh, Batman appears in two books, uh, Batman and Detective Comics. They were on the verge of canceling Detective Comics and the sales on Batman were, weren't good. So it was a big problem at DC Comics. So I was doing Batman over in, in a, a comic book called Brave and Bold. Mm -hmm. And all the fan letters were saying, well, that's the only Batman at DC Comics is the one in Brave and Bold. So the editor of Batman said, come on, you're gonna start doing Batman. So Denny O'Neill and I started to do Batman. And Denny O'Neill, it, 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 it's funny how things come together. Denny O'Neill was a reporter and he used to work the night beat on his newspaper. And that kind of realistic, gritty kind of story is exactly what Denny was able to contribute to the Batman stories. We didn't even do the clowns. We didn't do the Joker and Mad Hatter and those characters. We did uh, Orson Wellian type characters and, and people who could seem to be living uh, too long uh, mm -hmm. uh, lives because they were taking drugs and doing something illegal. So we turned Batman into a modern hero um, who fought crime at night, not in the daytime. Not, not walking down the street. <laughs> I'm knocking your doors, can I come in? Yeah, can I come in, hello. But because I come from the outside world, I could take a, a green arrow, for example, who was an imitation of Batman with his, his own little Robin, Speedy, and, yeah, his, Rich and, fights and, crime at night. and his arrow car with a little ejection seats that would shoot him up to, up to the second floor and you'd crash against the awning and fall down and die. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it, it was too much of an imitation of Batman. So when I got it to do in Brave and the Bold, I basically said to my editor, look, I'm not gonna do this imitation of Batman because it was never any good, it was, it was a stupid character, but it's a good name. And he shoots bows and arrows, so that's not Batman. Why don't I make him an imitation of Robin Hood, a modern day Robin Hood, then nobody would, can complain. So that's what I did, I made him, an, uh, in, in effect, a modern day Robin Hood. Well, that of course led to the television show. And now the television show is bringing all these other elements into it sure. that we can see Ra's al Ghul and Talia and all those other things, which actually were done in Batman. You know, it's interesting that the, the major change you made with, with Batman resulted in not just bringing the character back into relevancy and re-energizing him, but also lifted big sales. With Green Arrow and Green Lantern, you, you, made, the, you made the characters relevant because Green Lantern was also a second-rate you know, DC character at that point. I would of, not say that, I would not say that. Uh, but he wasn't the top tier, especially nothing like what he became afterwards. You have to remember, uh, Green, Green Lantern went through processes that if you're not a comic book fan, you don't, you don't quite realize. It was a, uh, an artist named Gil Kane, really brilliant artist. And he used to- a great to, artist in the, right, in the history, in the history of, of comics. He, he did Green Lantern and we read Green Lantern, the fans read Green Lantern because of Gil Kane. Didn't matter who wrote it. It was Gil Kane because his, his dynamic way of doing things. 
So he, even before I came around, he was doing this wonderful stuff. He then retired to do a graphic novel as an independent artist, independent creator, and then the artists that came after him, no offense, please, but they weren't very good compared to Gil Kane. So the question was, did it just rest on Gil Kane? Yes, it did. So I asked if I could do it, and I would try to do Gil Kane. I would do Gil Kane doing Green, Lan Green Lantern. But then Julie Schwartz said, well, wait a second. Since you did Green Arrow and you changed Green Arrow over in Brave and Bold, why don't we put them together in one comic book, make them politically opposite, and have a conflict between them? Sure, Green Lantern the liberal, and Green Lantern. Right, uh, against, against the conservative, conservative Green Lantern. So now Green Lantern was not just Green Lantern, but he was the conservative Green Lantern, the, the standard bearer of the Republican Party. And Green, and Green Arrow was the standard bearer of the Democratic Party or the liberal or whatever. And that conflict was great for the comic books because you could take these characters who are basically friends but thought differently and take them across America and have them actually see America through the eyes of these two superheroes who looked at everything differently. And that series of comic books is, is legendary. We introduced the first black superhero who was not a gangbanger and suddenly decided to become a comic book superhero because he got a superpower. He's a college graduate and a professional man. We did Is the- Is Jenster one, one of your proudest achievements in college? Oh, yes. I, I mean, look, I hate to brag, but I, I was uh, ashamed of our industry because, you know, the, I don't think that black people think that uh, a gangbanger suddenly becoming a superhero is actually a good model. And I don't think they think it's true because they're, they don't, uh, just like uh, white people, they do not, or Asian, it doesn't, ma doesn't matter. You're not proud of your gangbangers. You're proud of your college graduates. You're proud of your professional men. They're proud of people that have something to say in the world and, and, and who present themselves with, as equals to everybody else, and that's what John Stewart is. So John Stewart was the first character that did that, and uh, now there's lots. Now we have a very different uh, look to our comic books and our comic book characters. But it took somebody to do that, to make that very clear so that people could go, oh, I see. DC was a bit tone deaf back in those days. I remember the, the story world, the world. Line. It's the world not just DC, deaf. the but, world. But in terms of comics like DC and Marvel, they were both trying to come up with, with, with minority characters. And yeah, but they, you but, look back at them now and you. Ooh, yeah, 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 right. Black <laughs> Lightning. Right, right Black but, Lightning. So, like, Sorry. John Stewart was really a, 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 a sea modern, change there. A modern day man. A modern day man. Do you think John Stewart should be the next Green Lantern we see on film? I think that you, should, you should have Hal Jordan and John Stewart. I mean, that's the way that he was introduced. And it was, a, it was a, again, a little bit of a conflict between the characters. One of the first things that uh, John Stewart did was he burned the mask. He said, no, nah, I don't need the mask. I don't care if people know who I am. And you kind of go, yeah, that's very cool, very cool. So, so you have the difference between those two characters, and I think that's what I want to see in the film. I'd love to see that in the film. And, and uh, when they did the film, and this is not to uh, embarrass DC Comics, I think DC Comics had their heart in the right place, but I think that they were a little bit short-sighted.